Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to open to the book of Judges and chapter 17. This is one of two studies that we are going to be finishing up uh, this week, and then in a couple weeks will be our last study in Judges. And so we are quickly nearing the end of it, and I had mentioned when we started this series that it is the rated R part of the Bible, and uh, today is the beginning of it, and next week, or the next couple weeks will be the brutal ending. And, and I have to say it doesn't end well. Um, it's, it's one of those stories that you want to have a happy ending, but it just, it just doesn't. But there's so many truths uh, that are in here um, that we can take away that really, really uh, is treasure. So we're excited about that. The Bible says that we're to confess our sins to one another. So I'm going to confess my sin this morning. I have a problem. And all God's people, no, just kidding. Uh, Shelly doesn't get to say amen. She says, I know he's got a problem. I'm trying to tell him about it forever. I have a problem. My problem is, is that I am guilty of being a junk food junkie. I brought with me this morning my demise. And uh, by the way, if anybody wants any of this and not my grandchildren, uh, we're going to offer this up if anybody wants to take it. But I love snacks. Does anybody else here like snacks besides me? I, I just love them. Um, one of the all-time favorites are the Funyuns. These are around a long time ago. And of course, um, Shelly doesn't get into these, but uh, one of them is my jalapeno cheddar puff cheese. Oh, this is great. Can't eat this in the living room, though, with furniture. Um, and of course, no junk food is complete without combos, right? Pepperoni pizza. Oh, man, I just love it. Now, Shelly put in a few things in here. One of them, Reese's Pieces. You just can't stop eating them. And, and, I, and I just love this stuff. I got pudding. I got all kinds of stuff in here. Now, the idea is, is that if we snack, the idea, really preferably, would be to eat this stuff. <laughs> and all of you know what this is. It's that terrible word, fruit. How anybody could take an orange and open this thing up and actually eat it, I have no idea. Or these things, grapes. I mean, that, that just should not be allowed. And then this, bananas. I mean, after all, the texture. One of the, oh, I did have, I, I have an apple. Now, one of the problems I have with apples is you take a bite out of it, and then in a couple minutes later, it turns all brown. I mean, that doesn't happen with my combos. I mean, come on. Although, I have to tell you, I have to tell you, that when I got COVID, and uh, I'm, I'm getting over the, I can smell a little bit now, but I still don't have taste. So what I said to Shelly is, now that I can't taste, go get a bunch of fruit. And then I can eat it, and I don't have to worry about tasting it. Right? I know, you probably think I'm crazy. But the idea... Is, is that this is junk food. And I think if we're honest enough, we would admit that we have a tendency, spiritually speaking, to eat the junk food of the world. It's not that it's bad or a sin necessarily, but it's things that we could do, but there's other things that are better. Things that are more nutritious in the area of our spiritual lives. Junk food is fascinating stuff. And again, the problem with it is not that it tastes bad. It, it tastes good. It always tastes good. Nor does it immediately destroy us. It takes time. It takes time. Now, one of the things that we understand about junk food is the problem that there's really not a lot of nutritional value to it. It spoils our appetites. 
It satisfies a temporary craving. Just think of that. All this is doing is satisfying something temporary. Actually, when you eat the fruit, it is actually doing something that edifies your body physically. It's something that helps you to progress. And my question is this. Why is it that I'm attracted to this over this? Why is it that I don't have a natural tendency to want this? Now, I know there's many people that are much more sanctified than I am in this, in this uh, place today that would choose this over this. And for you, I salute you. But for the rest of us, it's a constant struggle to be able to temporarily fill a craving. I thought maybe one of the reasons that I lost my taste and my smell was that God was maybe teaching me a lesson about not having to satisfy that urge. Listen to this. The vista from the top of Sulphur Mountain just outside the town of Bandiff is one of the most picturesque views in the Canadian Rockies. A gondola takes you to the top of the mountain where you stand looking at peak after peak, stretching off into the distance in a virtual sea of mountains. Can you imagine the scene? The sun is shining, the snow is glistening, it's a breathtaking scene. On top of the mountain there is a tea house as well as a herd of mountain sheep. There are strong warning signs against feeding these sheep. And behind those signs is an interesting history. Several decades ago, the resident sheep had become very tame and accustomed to begging from handouts from tourists. They loved anything salty, and that was the problem. Those sheep were actually starving to death on a diet of peanuts, potato chips, popcorn, hamburger, licorice, and even salty plastic bags. As a result, the herd neglected its normal grass diet and the animals began to lose weight. And consequently, the females no longer produced high enough quality milk to nourish their lambs. One of the park wardens said, sheep develop a taste for this kind of junk. It's a pathetic thing to see, but there is really very little that we can do about it, he said. I wish people would realize their kindness amounts to cruelty. Those sheep actually become junk food junkies until park rangers took strong steps to cut off their supply of junk food. Isn't that interesting? Now, it's not only the four-legged sheep that have the nutritional problem, a fact evident by all the warnings and all of the serious consequences of obesity. By the way, that's a common epidemic happening within our culture, a real health epidemic. Now, we've finished exploring together the leadership that God has placed in the book of Judges. And if you will look behind me, the map of the book of Judges in Israel, we are actually shown the different types of leaders in the different areas. So you can kind of look throughout Palestine there and find some of the people that did their work to try to get Israel back on track. And if you look at the amount of them, all of the different people, Gideon, Jair, Jephna, Ehud, all of these people, as they moved throughout that entire culture, the people would repent, they would turn back to God, but they would just continue back in this cycle of sin. It's interesting because that same cycle plays out within our 21st century world. We are living in very much the same kind of culture where we have been warned, God has spoken, the people repent, they return to God only to going back to what is natural to them. This is the difficulty. In fact, folks, for 16 chapters, God has had compassion on His people. He's raised up deliverers, and now it's over. We are at part of the book of Judges where it is no longer going to happen. 
we're moving into the last part of the book. It deals with the overall consequences of Israel's rejection of God. In fact, in chapters 17 and 18, we are going to see the degeneration of Israel's relationship with God. It's a sad thing. And let me just tell you, today, 21st century America, we are seeing the very same thing. The destruction, the degeneration of what we used to have. Our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. And now, here it is, before we even know it. A country that was built on Christian principles has now come to the point where even now, there is a rejection of God. This is part of the cycle of being depraved, sinful creatures. In fact, what's really interesting is from this point on, from chapter 17 and 18, we will hear very little about God. Very little. Or we're not going to even hear words from God. For all intents and purposes, God has given them over. That's a terrible thought, isn't it? To be to the point where God has actually said, I've had enough, no more. And now you're not going to hear a word from me anymore. I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you go your own way. This is what you want. You don't need me anymore. You've got things to satisfy you. All of the pleasures of materialism. You've got things to entertain you. You have got things to keep you busy. You don't need me anymore. Terrible thought when you think about it from hindsight. And God has left His children to feel the full weight of the unfaithfulness to Him. These are the words, folks, of Romans chapter 1, verse 22. Take a look at it. We've read this many times. For although they knew God, by the way, most people know about God, they know Him, believe in Him. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resemble immortal man, birds, animals, and creeping things. It goes on. Therefore, because of that, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies, among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Paul says, I can't believe this. And before we begin to think of ourselves too highly this morning, we do the same thing in the materialistic world in which we live. There are things that take our attention away from God. Things that we would consider to be good things. Things that we enjoy, like the junk food. Things that aren't necessarily outwardly evil, but yet take the place of time with God. I won't ask a show of hands of how many actually made it through the Bible in a year for those that did that, but a lot of times I will talk to people and say, well, you know, I, I, I ran out of time. There just wasn't enough time. And what we have got to figure out is, what is it that is getting in the way with regular worship of God? Whether it be on a Sunday morning, or a Wednesday night, or a Bible study, or our own private devotions. What is it that gets in the way of that? That is the very thing we have to identify and begin to make inroads to remove it, or at least to push it back. That's the strong message for today. Is to identify the things that are crowding out time with God. Good things like jobs and, and hobbies, family. You can just list it. It just goes on and on. All of those are good things. But when they get in the way of God in first place is where it becomes difficult. 
The results of suppressing the presence of God in their lives is that God gave them over to their corrupt desires. And I think in our country, we have moved rather quickly down the same road as ancient Israel. It doesn't take much convincing to see the spiritual junk food that this country has bought into. Listen to this. The puzzle is why so many people live so badly. Not too or so wickedly, but so inanely. Not so cruelly, but so stupidly. There is little to admire and less to imitate in the people who are prominent in our culture. We have celebrities, but not saints. People aimless and bored amuse themselves with trivia and trash. Neither the adventure of goodness nor the pursuit of righteousness gets the headlines. Isn't that the truth? No Oscars are given for integrity. And at the year's end, no one compiles a list of the ten best lived lives. No, we, we celebrate idols, people. It's a terrible thing. The passage of Judges that we want to explore in chapter 17 really is going to present us with three brands of what we're going to call spiritual junk food. And as we come to the end of the book, we reach the epilogue in chapter 17 through 21. And its theme is the depth of Israel's Canaanization. The land of Canaan has now corrupted them. The people's sin of living like their enemies, the Canaanites. People who live wickedly and cruelly as well as absurdly and stupidly. It's no wonder that God had them taken out when they would invade the land. Women, children. By the way, let me just say this. God took radical action to ensure that Israel would not be corrupted. But it got to the point where Israel began to make concessions to the people. Maybe they had their own social justice movement where they allowed these people to survive within their midst rather than take a stand. Another thought in passing. If it came down to it, when would Christians stand up and fight for the principles that they believe in? What would it take? Or would we passively just allow it to happen in front of our faces? It's an interesting question. Don't have a solution to it. It's just an interesting question. So, as we look at this, there are two parts that we're going to look at. Notice in your notes this morning, in number one, the first thing that we're going to see today is dealing with religious corruption, chapter 17 and 18. And then, in a couple of weeks, we'll finish with dealing with moral corruptions. And that's chapters 19 through 21. Both of these epilogues focus on the fate of two tribes. And I want you to pay very close attention to this. There are two tribes that are going to play a prominent role. The tribe of Dan in 17 and 18 today. And then a tribe by the name of Benjamin in 19 through 21. I want you to see this map behind me of Dan and Benjamin. There they are. That's where the tribe is located. And that tribe being right next to each other is going to war against each other. In fact, what you're going to see in a couple of weeks is that one tribe becomes so wicked that God takes them out of the 12 tribes of Israel, as we're going to see today. He will literally remove their name forever. It's a terrible thing when we get to the point of no return. Think of that. The point of no return. A central part of the problem in both of the cases involves a Levite. You remember what a Levite is? There's someone that has been anointed as being a priest, God's chosen group to lead religious worship, which by this time, folks, has been corrupted. It's been corrupted. And both stories have a connection with Bethlehem. With Bethlehem. So look at your notes. The first brand of junk food is found in 
chapter 17, verses 1 through 6, the junk food of self-made religion. Self-made religion. Chapter 17, beginning with verse number 1. There was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. Now, this is not to be confused with the book of Micah. This is another guy that was a Hebrew name. And he said to his mother, now notice this carefully, the 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you, stolen, about which you uttered a curse, and also spoke it in my ears, behold, look at it, the silver is with me, and I took it. Now, now look at what his mother said. Blessed be my son by the Lord. What in the world is going on? Really a 21st century problem. We'll see it as we move through here. Now take a look at this. There are three separate traits that marked Micah's character. Okay, let's take a look at this. First of all, A, Micah was a thief. Stealing from his own mother. I mean, that's, that's about as bad as it gets. Right from the start, the story is a pathetic one. Here's a man living in the hill country of Ephraim, obviously from a very wealthy family, whose name is Micah. By the way, it's a Jewish name, and it means who is like the Lord. And now, who is unlike the Lord? He's betraying his very name. Totally contradiction. In fact, look at your notes. A total contradiction to his character and his actions. He's a thief. Which, by the way, I want you to see this because it's going to blow your mind. 1,100 silver shekels. You're thinking, man, I want to know how much that is. I, di I did the work. According to that figure, 1,100 shekels would have amounted to a year's wage for 110 years. That, folks, is a whole lot of money. The crazy thing is, Micah's mother is orthodox in her beliefs. In fact, she refers to God as Lord, L-O-R-D, capitalized Yahweh. And look how far they had degenerated. She didn't even have regard for God's law concerning idols. Hold your place in the book of Judges and turn back with me to the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy. And chapter 4. This woman is completely consumed with idolatry. And yet look at how far. And by the way, before we read the text, let me just say this. Today you can look at any particular issue that we as Christians would denounce. Let's just use same-sex marriage as one, right? Right? totally accepted by society. And yet, if you go back, the Lord has a ton to say about it. Agreed? Not only in the Old Testament, but the New Testament. Right there, and you're thinking, how can they possibly do that? Same thing here. Here's a woman living in flagrant idolatry, and yet, it's very clear. Let's take a look at it. Deuteronomy chapter 4, beginning with verse number 15. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb, out of the midst of the fire. Beware, lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth drop down to verse number 23 take care lest you forget the covenant of the lord your god which he made with you and make a carved image the form of anything that the lord your god has forbidden you look at it verse 24 for the lord your god is a consuming fire a jealous god so they ought to know better, just like 21st century ought to know better. It's written in the book. And by the way, God's Word doesn't change. He doesn't wake up one day and say, well, this one is sin, but in another two or 3,000 years, it won't be sin anymore. 
No, it doesn't work that way. So Micah is a thief. He has contradicted his name. Notice B in your notes. Micah was never corrected. Another 21st century problem. The failure to discipline children. Children are allowed to run wild because parents are too busy, too overconsumed. He heard that his mother cursing the thief in the name of God, he was terrified. Therefore, he brings the money back, explains why it was gone, but here's the shocker, his mother responded with a blessing. The Lord bless you, my son. My son may be a thief, but at least he's an honest one. Oh my goodness. This is it, folks. This is, this is where we're living today. This is why we wonder why the world is so messed up as we keep, we keep breeding this immorality into our children and we don't discipline them. Because I'm going to be quite honest, it's much easier to just ship them in a room somewhere or, or do whatever so that we don't have to deal with it. It's much easier to do that. And here, she's just, Totally acknowledging it. Look at this in your notes. Apparently the blessing was to cancel out the first effect of the curse, but the mother never condemned her son's actions. Never once. There was a good reason for that. She had a thief's heart as well. In verse 3, it says she consecrated the return money to the Lord. If you look at chapter 17, verses 3 and 4, Back in the text, you can see this. She totally had absolutely nothing to do with it. Verse 3, And he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother, and his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord, capital O, capital R, capital D, Yahweh, from my hand for my son, look at this, you guys, here it is, to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, who would ever do that? And yet, we do it today in our culture. We're doing it. The very same thing. So, we got to be careful when we look back and say, I would never do that. I don't drink, I don't chew, I don't hang around with people who do. Right? But yet, here, here we are. Did you catch that in the text in verse 4? She gave 200... Now, this is incredible. Look at it carefully. In verse 4 of the text, makes it very clear. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who made it into a carved image and a metal image, and it was in the house of Micah. Now, in verse 4, she gave 200 pieces of silver. What happened to the other 900 that she promised the Lord? Isn't that interesting? She just robbed God, folks. This is what Ananias and Sapphira did. Said, I'm going to do this for the Lord, and then when it comes down to it, oh man, I really need that money. I want it for myself. I'll just kind of hold it back. The Jewish people got really clever at that too. They didn't want to give away all the money that they had that they should have used on their families that needed it. So they called it Corbin. In other words, it's a gift devoted to God that no one else can use except me. Same thing. So she's robbing God. There's nothing worse, folks, than robbing God. I'm just going to tell you. You can't outgive God. When we give of our gifts and our offerings, we, we give bountifully from the heart. But if someone tries to slide it past God, he sees it, and God forbid if we try to rob God. A very, very serious thing indeed. Now, one of the things that we see here, he's a thief, he isn't corrected, he was never condemned see he had a pagan heart he had a pagan heart listen carefully 
This woman uses devout, sincere language for pagan purposes. The making of such idols, look at your notes, is a direct rebellion against God. As we saw in Deuteronomy, it was a veneer of worship over raw paganism. This was extreme and gross idolatry of the worst kind. And in a lesser way, mothers and fathers have no true values in which they can communicate to their kids. By the way, listen to this carefully, folks. If you don't hear anything else, listen to this. Kids learn by examples played out by their parents. They are watching you, moms and dads, to find out what you value. They watch your actions beginning on Sunday morning and throughout the week. Does mom or dad make excuses? Does mom and dad fall short? They're watching to find legitimacy. And if they don't find it, they grow up. We have a name for that. It's called being a hypocrite. Veneer. You know what veneer is. It looks like wood. And you peel it off and underneath it's just junk. And there are many, many, as we talked about last Sunday, veneer Christians or so-called Christians who appear to be genuine but are not. And this is, a, this is the warnings that are coming out of the text. This is incredible. Listen to this. One of the saddest phenomena of our time is the number of parents who have no true values to communicate to their children. Their children steal even from them, but they receive no discipline, no correction. Talk to almost any public school teacher who is a Christian. The major problem is not a lack of school discipline, but a lack of home discipline. In fact, teachers who try to punish an open, undeniable wrongdoing will often receive nothing but opposition and animosity from the child's parents, unquote. I've seen it happen time and time again. We've now made them the school's problem because we have not done what we've needed to do in discipline. So not only did Micah's mother not correct him, she actually led him into idolatry. And if we define idolatry as putting anything above God, here's the hard part, here's the kicker, here's the part that I had to squirm with in my study. What might this look like for us as parents and grandparents with our children? That kind of, kind of tweaks it a little bit, doesn't it? What am I doing to blow it? What am I allowing that I ought not allow? It's a question for every one of us to ask of ourselves. It's difficult. Showing kids that other things, activities come before God, they're watching. Showing our kiddos that church is important, but when other activities or events, whatever it might be, come up, we say, well, we're going to do that event rather than church. Family comes to our homes to visit. The priorities change. Concessions are made to accommodate our families. This is a widespread phenomenon. I failed in so many things, but there's one thing that Shelly and I have made a priority, and our kids knew it growing up, is that uh, I don't care who's coming to visit us. They're coming to church, baby. They're coming to church. We're not, we're not going to reaccommodate everything so that we miss the priority. And so if we have family traveling in from other states and they happen to arrive on a Friday night and, or a Saturday night, they know we're going to church. Now, they may not want to come. You stay home. You'll see us after we go to church. That speaks more volumes than watching the kids and the grandkids say, well, Aunt Janine is coming in Saturday night, so we're not going to go to church. Well, it got quiet in here, so I'd better move on. <laughs> All right, so moving past that one, we move on then to the whole idea. Micah established a full fledged shrine in his home. Look at verse 5. And the man, Micah, had a shrine. Now, look at this. He made an ephod and household gods. And if that's not bad enough, he ordained one of his sons to become his priest. Wow. 
This shrine was complete with a priestly garment, an ephod, a molten image, an idol of pure silver. A graven image, of course, was a carved idol that was coated with silver. A number of portable household gods. They are also known as teraphim in the Bible. He then went one step further. He installed one of his sons, a non-Levite, as a priest. At this point, God's Word declares that as an act of spiritual anarchy. Look behind me, Deuteronomy chapter 12. Look at this. You shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their asherim with fire. You shall chop down their carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear. Look at Take care that you do not offer your burnt offerings at any place that you see, but look at this, at the place that the Lord will choose in one of your tribes, which is Judah and Jerusalem. Therefore you shall offer your burnt offerings there, and you shall do all that I commanded you. They, they're, they're just destroying and ripping up Deuteronomy. It's incredible. So, look at verse 6. Micah presented the mood of the times. Look at verse 6. This is the mood of the times. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Look at it. If you want a, a word that describes what we've been studying, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That, folks, is a 21st century motto. Doing right by what we think. So Micah has invented his own little religion in the hills of Ephraim, not far from the site of God's tabernacle, which happened to at this point been in Shiloh, it was homemade worship with a self-made God, and God hated it. That brings us to number two in your notes. Take a look at it. The junk food of self-serving worship. The junk food of self-serving worship. Look at verse 7. Now there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite. And he sojourned there. And the man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. And as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, Where do you come from? And he said to him, I'm a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm going to sojourn where I can find a place. Oh man, look at verse 10. And Micah said to him, stay with me and be to me a father and a priest and I will give you ten pieces of silver a year, a suit of clothes, and your living. And the Levite went in. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man and the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah ordained the Levite and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Now look at this. this. This is his rationale. Verse 13, Then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord, Yahweh, will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. He, he knows that a Levite is the only one to be a priest. He says, Now I've got one. This Levite set out from Bethlehem looking for a place to better himself. It was Perfectly normal ambition, except, look at your notes, in this case, it was totally contrary to the will of God. Wow. You see, it wasn't wrong for him to want to find a place to minister. The problem was, it wasn't the will of God. I go back to this time and time again. Shelley and I learned this the hard way. Nothing wrong with prospering. It just doesn't happen to be the will of God. The will of God said, you belong here. This is where I gave you the place to minister. And I know it always looks attractive to find something else or something better. But the reality is, is it was against God's will. And if it's against God's will, He could prosper it to a certain extent. 
But this is way out of the boundaries because the place is filled with idolatry. Levites were men who had the call of God upon their lives. They were not to be opportunists moving from place to place looking for a job. There it is. They had been assigned a specific city in which to live. And that was where they were to reside and serve God. And as a matter of fact, this man probably should have been in Bethlehem in the first place since it was not a Levitical city. The commentator goes on to say, here was a man who refused to be satisfied with God's arrangement for his life. Not to be satisfied with God's arrangement for his life. This was knocking me upside my head the whole time I was studying it. God has given him an area of service, and had he lived faithfully within the sphere of his divine calling, the Lord would have extended his area of ministry. But he was committed to self-promotion and to personal betterment. Ooh! Ouch! Nothing wrong with trying to better yourself. Nothing wrong with trying to do what we think the Lord wants us to do. And believe me, we can rationalize all kinds of things to say it's God's will. One of Satan's most subtlest devices is to cause Christians, look at your notes, to become dissatisfied with the circumstances and the area of service that God has given to them. And it's very subtle, folks. It's very subtle. I should be in the public more, I should be paid more, I should receive more praise, or people leave the church because no one pays enough attention to them. The list goes on and on and on. Now notice what happens between the Levite and Micah. Micah has some doubts about the legitimacy or the status of his little homemade religion. He wanted a legitimate Levite priest, and the Levite wanted a job. He was Micah's priest, not God's. Wait do you see, by the way, his identity at the end of the sermon. Wait do you see this Levite's identity. There was another direct violation of God's law, number 16. Korah tried to act as a priest, if you remember. God intervened by opening up the ground. Think of that scene. Do you remember that scene? This guy had the nerve to stand up against Moses and said, you're not the only one that is the leader I'm a leader too, baby. And if that's not so bad, Moses said, okay, the Lord's going to decide tomorrow who's going to be his and who's not going to be. And if you remember that story, I would have been scared to death to be Korah, especially his family, because God said, your whole family, Korah, has got to meet right over here and Moses over here. Can you imagine it? Moses is over here and you've got all of Korah and his whole family over here. If I was one of Korah's uh, nephews, I would have said, excuse me, I'm going to go over here. (laughs) But no, all of a sudden God says, Lord, show who you want to be a leader. And all of a sudden, the whole ground over here opens up and everybody falls in alive. Can you imagine that? The whole earth shaking as the whole ground opens up and takes everybody in Korah's family, including the animals, all swallowed up. I don't know about you, but if I was the people over here and I kind of had a thing against Moses, I don't know, Moses, I don't know about him, I would have shut my mouth. No way am I going to say anything against this leader. But see, the problem is, is the pride of man and his ambition says, I have a right to be heard. I have a right. And God showed clearly who it was. It's, it's incredible. Well, beginning in chapter 18, we see the third brand of junk food. Look at your notes. The junk food of self-seeking materialism. The chapter begins with the theme of Israel's depraved condition, and this Levite meets a wandering opportunic tribe, a tribe of Dan. Here's Dan. Judges chapter 18, verse 1. In those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the people of Dan were seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in, for until then no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. So the people of Dan sent five able men from the whole number of their tribe 
from Zorah and from Eshthal to spy over the land and explore it. And they said to them, go and explore the land. And they came to the hill country, here it is, of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. And they lodged there, and when they were by the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. And they turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What's your business here? And he said to them, This is how Micah has dealt with me. He has hired me. I have become his priest. Look at verse 5. They said to him, Inquire of God, please, that we may know whether the journey on which we are setting out will succeed. Look at that. Perhaps Micah consulted an oracle or maybe he asked counsel by an ephod or the teraphim or simply responded from his own head or by a voice maybe that he heard which Satan might have permitted to deliver to him. In any event, he told them that they could proceed on their journey. Verse 6, And the priest said to them, Go in peace, the journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. That's Hebrew for he will be protected. With their minds put to ease, with reassurance of success, along the way they decided to steal Micah's idols. This is incredible. Verse 7. Then the five men departed and came to Laish, saw the people who were there, how they lived in security after the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and unsuspecting, lacking nothing that is in the earth, possessing wealth, and how they were far from the Sidonians and had no dealings with anyone. And when they came to their brothers at Zorah and Eshtal, their brothers said to them, What do you report? They said, Arise, let us go up against them, for we have seen the land. Behold, it's very good. And will you do nothing? Do not be slow to go. Enter and possess the land. They're going to take over their own people. As soon as you go, we will come to an unsuspecting people. The land is spacious. God has given it into their hands, a place where there is no lack of anything that is on the earth. So, 600 men from the tribe of Dan, armed with weapons of war, set out for Zorah and Eshtal. And they went up and encamped at kiriath Jerim in Judah. On this account, that place is called Manahadan to this day. Behold, it is west of kiriath Jerim. And they passed on from there to the hill country of Ephraim, and they came to the house of Micah. And when the five men who had gone to scout out the country of Laish said to their brothers, Do you know that in these houses there is an ephod, household gods, a carved image, and a metal image? Now therefore consider what you will do. They turned aside there. They came to the house of the young Levite at the home of Micah, and they asked him about his welfare. And now the 600 men of the Danites, armed with their weapons of war, stood by the entrance of the gate. And the five men who had gone to scout out the land went up and entered and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, the metal image, while the priest stood by the entrance of the gate with the 600 men armed with weapons of war. And when these men went into Micah's house, they took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, the metal image, and the priest said to them, Hey, dude, what are you doing? What's going on? You know, What's happening? Look at verse 19. They said to him, Keep quiet, put your hand on your mouth, and come with us, and be to us a father and a priest. I love this. Look at this opportunity. It is better for you to be a priest to the house of one man or be the priest to a tribe of the clan of Israel. And the priest's heart was glad. <laughs> he took the ephod and the household gods, carved image, went along with the people. So they turned and departed, putting the little ones on the livestock and the goods in front of them. The Levites like, cool, dude, no problem. I'm all about expanding my territory. If this were not so sad, we might laugh, but look at your notes. The Levite was getting a promotion. He was climbing the spiritual ladder. There's an old story about a preacher who had received a call from a larger church, but was it God's will? Somebody from his present smaller church called to talk about it, and the pastor's little girl met him at the door. Where's your mom and dad, dear? Oh, dad's upstairs praying about the move, and mom's downstairs packing. To be honest, usually the preacher packs while the wife prays. 
It's interesting. And here he's taking the opportunity to take off. Question. Do you think this new promotion for Micah is going to be a smooth transition? Not. There's at least one guy who isn't overly thrilled about the Levites' new prospect. Verse 22. When they had gone a distance from the house of Micah, the men who were in the house, houses near Micah's house were called out. They overtook the people of Dan and they shouted to the people of Dan who turned around and said to Micah, What's the matter with you? And you come with such a company? And he said, You take my gods that I made and the priest and go away? And what have I left? How do you then ask me what's the matter with you? I love the response of these guys. Verse 25. The people of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows fall upon you and you lose your life and the lives of your household. You make a move on us, you're going to be wiped out. So then the people of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his home. Self-promoting upward mobility of the Levite was taking him deeper and deeper into the opacity of sin. Self-seeking materialism had captured his heart, and it really led the tribe into deeper judgment from God. So we move quickly to the sad invasion of Laish. Look at verse 27. But the people of Dan took what Micah had made and the priest who belonged to him, and they came to Laish, to a people quiet and unsuspecting. Then they struck them with the edge of the sword, burned the city with fire, and there was no deliverer because it was far from Sidon, and they had no dealings with anyone. At this point, let me pause just to say, have you heard anything about God? God's doing nothing here, is he? It was in the valley that belongs to Beth Rahab, and they rebuilt the city and lived in it, and they renamed the city Dan after the name of Dan, their ancestor, who was born to Israel, but the name of the city was Laish at the first. Prophecy is now accomplished concerning Dan that was given by Moses back in Deuteronomy 33. Take a look at this. Deuteronomy. Do we have it up there, Deb? No? Okay. Back in Deuteronomy 33, 22, it talks about the fact that God would judge the people that would break His covenant and break His law. In fact, this short little verse describes the fierceness of the tribe of Dan. Look at your notes. Dan becomes so corrupt, this is incredible, that the tribe is not even mentioned in the book of Revelation 7 with the 144,000 sealed remnant of Israel. For those of you who Bible study through prophecy, he's not there. He's gone. So we come now to the end of the story here with a really a, a sad display of worship that would mark them until God would finally turn them over to captivity. By the way, we also learn the identity of this Levite. So hold on. Are you ready? Verse 30. And the people of Dan set up the carved image for themselves and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of who? Moses. And his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of captivity of the land. And so they set up Micah's carved image that he had made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. Look at this. This was the most precious lineage for a Levite. Right from Gershom, right from Moses. Just three or four generations, and look what they spiraled into. It's incredible. We learn that the Levite is Jonathan, son of Gershom, the son of Moses. This is really mind blowing. A direct descendant of Moses, his ancestry is traced back to God who gave Moses the law in the first place. It's incredible. By the way, let me just give you something here. It's very interesting. Today, this is true of today, okay? The early Jewish scribes were so embarrassed by this because of this lineage of Moses. They were so concerned to protect the memory of Moses that they altered the name, making it read the son of Manasseh. 
The change only involves the addition of one letter. But that one letter is significant. It does not matter what great spiritual leaders we may have in our ancestry. The great lawgiver had a great grandson who was a great lawbreaker. It is a stark reminder that it does not do any good to have a godly ancestor if you don't know God yourself. Let me say this, folks. Godliness is not generic or genetically down the line. You aren't a Christian just because your parents and grandparents and whoever might be there. It doesn't work that way. Let me give you two final thoughts and one question and then we're through. Here's the first one. Godliness begins with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. This is the part where I tell you that we are sinners in need of a Savior. There is nothing that your parents can do for you. There's nothing that your baptism could have ever done or your profession of faith. None of that matters if you don't have a personal relationship with Christ. Do you know Him this morning? Do you have that vital, intimate connection? And then once we experience salvation, the Bible says we are to grow up in that salvation. Before you close your Bibles, turn with me to one last passage and then we're through. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse number 1. Very important passage as we look at this. It says, So put away all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may, circle the two words, grow up. That you may grow up into salvation. And doesn't mean that you become saved. In your salvation is the correct translation. In it. In the salvation that you already have, grow up. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Listen, folks, it does not matter how good junk food tastes. It's still junk. And if it becomes more important to us than the pure milk of God's Word, it will destroy us. Question. Do you have any junk food in your spiritual diet? Just, just name it, whatever it might be in your own heart. The things that you watch, games that you play, hobbies that you have, even work. Does it interfere with your relationship with God? We have to be careful because you are what you eat, spiritually speaking. Let's pray.